Houston, Texas. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube. Covering Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Welcome back everyone. We are live here in Houston, Texas for the Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing. This is SiliconANGLE's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furry, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm my co-host Jeff Frick, the general manager of theCUBE business here at SiliconANGLE Media. Our next guest is Eileen Fagan, Vice President of Innovation and Transformation Work Programs at Intuit. Yes. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much. Great to see you. you. I mentioned your name on our intro this morning on day, day two kickoff around the opportunities that are out there. Certainly the gender pay thing is the top story that CNBC and the New York Times will write about. That if it bleeds, it leads. That's the, the red meat that causes controversy. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of women in tech today, still needs more, but there's opportunities. And this, this community here demonstrates clearly that there is support and a big community. You've been a, had a, a great career, a computer science major. Um, in the prime of your, your career, you're a tech athlete, both baseball fans, we talked about that <laughs> yesterday. Um, Go Blue Jays. What are you doing at Intuit? Talk about the role at Intuit, because you're operationalizing some cool things. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you step back and think about it, the world, the one constant in the world is change, right? Individuals have to change, companies have to change. And you take a company like Intuit that's been around for 31 years, we continue to have to evolve. It's my job to drive our transformational change programs, and it's, I have to say, it's a fun job. It is always high risk, high visibility, and never been done before kind of stuff, which is, makes it fun, and it relies on my tech background, but um, we have to think about, both as individuals and, and at a company level, what is it that we need to change? And the first thing we do when we operationalize that is we go out and we learn from the best wheel makers. This is a good example from an individual level, a great place to go and learn what's going on. We've seen all kinds of fascinating things here. I'm sure you've seen yeah. a bunch. Is it lonely at the top as you climb that mountain, as we say, <laughs> you know, entrepreneurs <laughs> have the same problem too. It's like the CEOs of a startup is probably the loneliest job on the planet. Uh, women in tech also can be an interesting journey. Share your perspective because you've had a great career. You had a computer, again, computer science major. Back when it was all male dominated. Right. Back at IBM, you worked at, we both worked at IBM back in the day. Uh, even today, there's more computer science. Stanford University just announced that women in computer science is the most popular major for women across the entire school. Um, there's new roles in computer science, visualization, user experience, applications, entrepreneurship. So the definition is changing but your journey has been interesting, so share your thoughts on, uh, on what you've been through. Uh, going way back, and you're right, I was a computer science major in <clears throat> the 80s, and <laughs> it, it, you know, there were not a lot of women in that field at that time, I, and it's great to see that transformation. I started at IBM as a programmer. We were building satellite control systems, which was very fun uh, and interesting. I mean, think about satellite data way back when, but on big mainframes and different kinds of technology than we're working on today. And then I drifted into a marketing world because you know that was an, another interesting place to go. MCI was my customer, telecom was big back in the day. And then we went, and then I, I actually took a leap and became an entrepreneur. And you know, if I think about that journey, it was, an interesting step outside of a big company and, and that realization of, now I'm going to work with 100 companies around the world, and boy, do you start to see a different perspective in, in lots of different places. Well, IBM had a great culture, even though male dominated, they still was a great culture. It was when you got out in the wild, welcome to the real world kind of thing. Yes, indeed. <laughs> lots of interesting um, things. Back in those days, there were moments of, I would be the only person in the room that some, you know, the men wouldn't shake hands with. There was a Eileen go get the coffee kind of a moment, even though you know I'm the consultant coming in. It was an interesting world. The world has changed a lot, and it's so great to see. You know, there are women executives; they're not treated that way anymore. It is a great um, 
I, I actually think there's a ton of opportunity and a ton of- Well, we'll come of, back to some of the things that we'll talk about uh, culturally, I think that, that you're leaping been through, but also the change that's happening now is a lot of the younger generations coming in and certainly they have not been exposed. They don't have that scar tissue. Thank they God. haven't been, you know, they might have been bullied and harassed, all that stuff happens all, all the time, mostly more on women than men, obviously on the online and whatnot, but, but now there's real careers, there's real career growth, and so the flywheel is developing around women in tech or women are in tech generally across the board in computer science. So what are the things that, that you see that are important to really operationalize not only the pipeline or whatever they're going to call it, but also attitudes and policies and the word politically correct gets kicked around all the time, which you know, I cringe, I mean, I don't like that term. A lot of women that I know don't like that term either. It kind of reinforces <laughs> bad things. What's your take right. on the operationalizing of, of uh, opportunity? Well, I, I think when it comes to opportunity, you know, you're right, there are a lot of young women who are coming out now have technical backgrounds. They, they need to be able to look up and see women in positions of power, and they need to be able to see women being successful and being able to do interesting things. The things that, that women really want to focus on, I think, and men, I don't think it's actually any different. They want to change the world. I mean, isn't that what we all want? We want to make an impact. And we're all looking to do that. And so it's interesting, I did a little poll this morning around what are the questions that women would most like to be asked when they're being interviewed or you know, they, they're out talking about what they do. Hold on, this is just to interrupt, this is a play on the whole interview uh, debacle that happened at Dreamforce around Susan Wojcicki. Um, right. you know, how many husbands have you had? How do you balance <laughs> it? All these female questions. And men right. don't get the same question. Men don't get the same questions, right? They don't get focused on collab collaboration and their work-life balance. So we were, we were talking about what are the worst questions you had, so instead we're going to turn it around. And talk about what are the questions women okay. wish they were uh, asked more frequently. So what's the, the poll saying? Let's right. get down. So, here's, so here, the, here we could do a little family feud thing and talk about, <laughs> we'll, we'll, eh. but here are the questions that came up at the top of the list. What is the future of the company? What is the future of you know, technology? What are the company's strategic priorities? What am I doing? So instead of, talking about how I'm doing it, which is often, I think, the questions that people go down, ask me what I'm working on. And that, I think, is really interesting. Ask me about my technical expertise, my background. What are some of the interesting technologies that I'm working on? So those are sort of the top questions that women really want to hear, and I really think it's a switch from how do I do my job to what am I doing? Because there's a lot of, as you point out, there's a ton of interesting yeah. things that women are working on. And there's been some fantastic talks here around different technologies and things that people are really Yeah, I think that on. gets wa washed out in the, in the uh, laundry is that people forget that they're doing great stuff and mm -hmm. that they focus in on what they think everyone wants to hear. Hey, how do you balance your job? How do you take care of your kids? Do you feel bad about that? These are the kind of annoying questions that come up all the right. time. And, it, and it really, I think it's, don't ask me about the differences, about me, the, what makes me different. Ask me about what I'm doing that's super interesting. Okay, so what are you doing that, that's super <laughs> that's interesting? super interesting. <laughs> what a great question, John. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> so, you know, we, it, my role, as I said, is to drive change and innovation at Intuit. And I, you know, it's a company that I love because we're very mission focused and we're very values based, but we have to continue to evolve. And our, our job is to think about how to go out and see what are the things that we need to do differently. And I'll give you an example because, you know, I have a big title, but people always ask, what does that actually mean? And so if you think about, I'll just dial back several years because it's an easy thing to understand. You know, back in the day when the iPhone came out, we looked around and everybody was carrying them at the executive level and throughout the company, everybody has one, but our products aren't on phone. This is, I mean, we're going back to like 2009, 2010 here. But still, it was sort of like, uh, why not? And then you dig in and you start to ask the questions, why not? Well, if you remember back in that day, apps were 99 cents or they were free. So what drives a general manager to allocate resources against something? How am I going to make money? So we turned around and we said, all right, we got to look at how to, how to, are people actually making money? 
And we took our entire executive team in for a two-day offsite, and we did two things. We had them all talk to people who were making money and had tremendous growth rates in the mobile world. And we had them go off and do a little scavenger hunt to play with the um, actual native features of a, of a mobile phone back in that day. And it was amazing how having that visceral, personal experience can really change the direction. So one of the things that we, we get to do is we go out and we look and learn. That's the, probably my most favorite part of my job. We're working on right now, companies, big software companies tend to do what? They tend to slow down and, you, and get a little behind in technology. There's a yeah. ton of those things in the, in the news all the time. So what do, you, what do you need to think about to do that? Well, the first thing we tend to do is go out and learn from other companies. Yeah. You know, the, if there's one thing that's true, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed, right? That's yeah. not, I'm obviously <laughs> stealing that quote from somebody else, but it, it's It's so, a great quote. It is a great quote and it's so true, so why not go out and learn from the best wheel makers? And then my job is to think about how to bring that in and apply that in our world, which is going to be different than anybody else's. And just, just when you're going through those questions, and you're going to have to give us the list before you leave. Yes. Um, the so you can versus, use them all day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but you know, we had Renee Zog on from Edna, and and she talked about really again. We talked about this yesterday, but the language of business and, and the what. And and when she talked, she talked about how much money she made the company in a dollar number that gets people's attention, not how she did it or why she did it or right. her process, but. She goes right to the bottom line right. and, and gets your attention. When we talked to Kim Stevenson a few weeks back, she talked about her IT department. I remember now, it was humongous, hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of impact. It goes right to the number. And what a difference that does um, to just be you know, kind of full frontal with business impact. Right, right. Yeah, because women are doing those things, right? We are driving a lot of that stuff, and there are women in the executive suite, maybe not in big numbers, but certainly in impact. These things are happening, and there's no reason why we can't talk about what those things are. Well, you said differences. People always like to talk about the differences, and you said don't do that, talk about what they're working on. But if you mm -hmm. look at what people are working on, you can then look at the differences. Men and women are different. Boys and girls are different. Um, love that, that clip from the elementary school, the girl, girl backpacks are over here and the boys are over here. Natural clustering, just natural genetic human behavior. But as one society now, there are differences. I want to ask you the specific question, based on what people are working on, women in particular, mm -hmm. in computer science today. Mm -hmm. How has computer science changed? We were speculating on the opening that you know, the range of disciplines with UX now has opened up a, a whole new set of opportunities, machine learning. There's a lot of creative data science work going on. So is there actually a difference in application of the female brain? <laughs> Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, whatever the expression goes. I mean, mm -hmm. are there certain things that women are just better than men at, in your opinion, statistically or just anecdotally, when it comes to computer science? Interesting question. I, you know, certainly there are a lot of women in the design world, but I, you know what? I am scanning my brain and, it's hard and, to, it's a hard, and uh, I honestly, I can think of incredibly talented women who are doing all of the different technology things you, you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, data scientists at, at Intuit, several of them are women. We've got phen phenomenal um, deep technology people who are doing the underpinning uh, mobile, how to get data out of mobile devices, right? Like how do we pull... Um, so you really don't really see a pattern. I don't, I, you know, there, there are probably certain things, you know, the one that comes to mind is architecture tends to be male dominated, but not, enti not entirely, but that was, that's one that I- That's one I, that might be a little bit tipping in the scales. Maybe that's just because I see that. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say, I mean, I may, I'm biased. I mean, I have my own bias, I'm just, you know. I, yeah. What do you see? Yeah, I mean, what I see, I mean, it's my bias, maybe that's wrong, but I do see women across the board. I think computer science certainly has changed. Back in the 80s, it was systems programming. Yeah. You know, now it's across the board, a lot of coding and also design. Um, now I want to shift gears to a tweet I just uh, read here. It says, advice, this is from the keynote from Susan Wojcicki, advice for women starting their careers. Find where you can learn, grow, and find unique things you want to do. Yes. Um, so, that brings up the whole 
how to start what? your career, how to start the journey, and also brings up this concept of mentorship and sponsorship. And we get sponsors for theCUBE to bring us here. That's cash, that's help. So that's about getting help. Mm -hmm. How is sponsorship and mentoring and helping people get into the workplace, what's that dynamic today? And how's it compare from when you were in your career early on? You know, if I think back, so let me, let me answer today. I think it's, um, there are certainly, Mentorship is really important. I think, again, women need to be able to join a place that they feel really excited and passionate about the work that they're doing. And then they can find that sponsorship from anybody. I don't think it always has to be other women. You know, you, if you find your niche of what you love to do, I think there's a lot of opportunity for you to just stay focused on that and those opportunities are out there. You just keep looking yeah. and, and looking for them. Certainly finding other women who can help you. And, and I do find that I have women who work for me, for instance, who are struggling sometime with a work-life balance and things like that, and I help them As navigate. As do the men, by the way. <laughs> yes, exactly. I help them navigate that path and stay focused on what it is they really, really care about. And so I, I think where people will find their sponsors is through that passion of what they really, really want to do. That's my belief. I mean, it's not about going out and looking for a, a sponsor who can help me necessarily just get to the next level. It's constantly putting yourself out there and learning and staying at the cutting edge. Yeah, so I, mean, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about your job and, and transforming a big company that's been around for a long time. It's really hard, right? Innovator's Dilemma, still my all-time favorite business book, right? Yep. Smart people making Smart business decisions based on data will always miss transformational change. And we saw it took a change at the top of Microsoft with Satya to come on and really shift their gears into cloud. We're seeing with the EMC Dell thing as we come off of AWS, yep. you know, again, are they kind of late to the game? It's very hard to get people to change because again, logical people making sound decisions based on what their customers are asking for right. always miss discontinuous change. So what are some of the tips and tricks that you can share your VP of transformational change. How do you start to make these big shifts and big changes in an organization that's been successful for a very long time with a real core set of products and services? And it, it, so you make a great point and it, companies will have to fight inertia, right? Because that's the number one thing that they'll do is stay where the money is today right, and right. not think about where it's going to come from tomorrow. And that's, part of the other part of my job, and there's a reason why they're together, is the innovation part, and thinking about what is coming. So we have an innovation advanced technology team, and our job is to be constantly looking around the corner, looking around the bend. What is it that's coming down the pike? We're looking today at things like the Internet of Things, and how is that going to change people's personal financial lives, right? That's, that's what our mission is about, improving people's financial lives. If you think about a world where there's data everywhere and there's the internet of things, you, you have to start to think about how is that world going to change. So, but of course that's like, that's interesting to people, but you're not going to get people to shift on a dime to think about that. So again, it's, it's step one is to actually go out there and explore what is the world going to be like. Then we pick those couple things that we think are going to be very impactful to our customers and we start to do some experiments. And you know, we're very focused on experimentation as a way to drive change. And then once we figure that, we sort of think about it as explore, qualify, and then once we say this is a change that is really important, then we go all the way in and we start to look for experiential ways for people to understand that change. Like th that's why I told the mobile example. Right. Because right. it's a good example, an easy to understand one of how you start to get that change. People don't get changed from PowerPoint. That's my belief. Like, you can tell me right. the world's going to change. You can do some PowerPoint exercises. I can point to things. You, John, you told a story yesterday about trying to forecast, like, the world's going this way, and people just go, yeah, you know what, we're doing this because that's what we know we, we're good right. at. Yeah, the passion drives the people, and I think that's a key thing. I got to ask you, as someone who's leading a lot of change at a senior level, do you look around and say, hey, we need more people, you, know, you need more peers, there are enough people at, at your level doing work, um, and then 
how do you see your vision of the preferred future if you could have the magic, magic wand or the pixie dust or the three wishes from the genie in the bottle? So one, peers at the top, mm -hmm. leadership. Who do you talk to? How do you like get stuff off your chest or like, you know, just riff on creative ideas at your level. I mean, how do you stay from not being too lonely and then to your vision of the future? Well, we, you know, the good news, I feel very fortunate that we have some incredibly smart people. I, you know, I work a lot with our founder, Scott Cook, who's still very actively involved in the company and he is just a learner at, in an incredible level. I've never seen anybody out learning about everything all the time. We have, an, like I said, an innovation advanced technology team, so there is a group of us who can, you know, kind of immerse ourselves in that world of what's interesting and what's coming. And of course our leader, Brad Smith, is also a learner and I've never seen anybody picked up, pick up those new things and say, oh, we need to think about that. How are we going to weave that in? Um, so I, I don't feel lonely in that regard. There's a lot of people who are really are invested in understanding that this is super important. It's funny you say that, because Olga also really mentioned from into it, really a culture of learning, and you don't necessarily hear that um, kind of top of mind awareness is really a core value uh, from a company. And it, it, it really, really is. It's something now, I, you know, I, t I do tend to drive a lot of our corporate learning, you know, going out. We, you know, we, last year we focused on really deep learning too, like actually going in. I was telling this story to somebody from an executive level. One, one year we had our executives go out and actually shadow other leaders. Now, you'd think that's an interesting thing shadow to do. Shadow other leaders in the company or no, external? No, outside. Okay. So we actually had our C-level um, executives go out and we matched them up with executives at various companies around the valley, around the world actually, and they spent a day watching what they were doing. And so here's the most fascinating part of that. In almost all cases, they sat down and interviewed the executive at first, and the executive said, yeah, this is what we do, and they told, told them, here's, here's, here's what we do, here's how I run the company, here's the meetings I'll have, here's what you'll see. And then they went in and they ob actually observed those meetings. Completely different. It almost never matched. <laughs> and, and, and so you would ask yourself, why would those executives let us come in? So certainly they, they were willing to let us learn, but what they got back was, here's what I observed. Let's talk about what you, know, what, what you yeah, did. So a blind spot potentially for the executives, they're sharing their culture and trying to give us some collaboration but yet realize, wait a minute, that's not working out the way I wanted it to. Yeah, exactly, we, learned, we thought about it at one point, and I did a bunch of research on product reviews. Very standard thing, think about, I mean, it sounds boring, right? But think about this, all over the place, people are doing product reviews as a way to decide what to build. Are we building the right thing? How are we building it, et cetera? Do you know there's almost, there's very, very limited data out there about how to do a good product review? It seems kind of, kind of funny that that's true. Like nobody writes about it, nobody thinks about it, and yet it's so core to how products get built. So we went and did what we do. We shattered a bunch of people doing them and, and got to watch different people across the valley and then we did it with our own executives and we realized, you know what? Yeah. We don't, nobody teaches an executive how to do a good product review. There was no, there's nothing in their literature, so people grow up doing what they do, what yeah. they saw somebody else Off do. Off the cuff or last company or Last other. company, what I learned, what I saw somebody I admired do, or frankly, hadn't really thought about it. And so we actually had them videotape themselves doing it, and then we got to talk about that, and they, they would learn. And we set up some training sessions where, not, it was more of a um, seminar where people did product reviews in front of the other executives and they got to watch and learn and you know we learned some really interesting things about how you want to leave a team you want because it's really about the people who are building yeah. the product right there's the product you're looking at but how do you want to leave the team they better be focused on what they're supposed to do they better know what they need to do and be energized to go do it right, right. these so, are fundamental kind so, of things so what are the observations that we're making here on the cubes so now second day obviously we've done grace hopper last year we did a flyby there is that there's no real right answer. The context of women in tech can always be blown out of proportion, but the one thing that's consistent that moves the mission forward, and I want to get your thoughts on this, this is kind of our observation from the data we're seeing, is um, always be learning, 
and transparency. Those are the two consistent variables that seem to move the ball down the field relative to changing things. Whether it's more pay, more opportunities, product reviews, integration, fixing the workplace. What's your comments on that? Because that seems to be the fixed variables that seems to do well. That keep coming back up. That keep coming back up. Always be learning, because if you're learning, you're learning new stuff, you're aware. And if you're transparent, you got the right data. Right and being transparent about what you know and what you don't know. So I actually love that observation. I think being a constant learner and a lifelong learner is what is going to make us all successful and staying passionate about what we do. Hopefully, you know, and I think this is true for women and men, that we don't get to a place where we're like, yeah, we, I know. I know how to, I know how to do, because the world keeps changing. And even if you think you know, there's always a way to do it better. And so, one of the big things that we focus on also is experimentation. Not believing, there, there's uh, the highest paid opinion in the room often wins. What about data, right? Go out and experiment. So often if people come in and they tell me, nope, this is what we should do, or um, I know that that button should be orange or something else, it's really, have you, yeah. have you run some experiments with real customers? Have you run some tests on the way we're going to try to change things? That's what we did with the product reviews. We just ran experiments. We watched people do it and we learned. There's nothing like learning by doing. That would be the one comment right. that I would ask Fine. is not just learning, book learning, but learning by doing. And be vulnerable. Be vulnerable, and that goes with your transparency comment. Yeah. Being vulnerable and willing to say, hey, I don't know, but I'm going to dive in. Eileen, thanks so much for sharing your insight here on theCUBE, really appreciate the data and sharing with the folks out there. Um, final question, what's the vibe like here? Just give a quick uh, 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 take, because a lot of people are, are, have a FOMO right now, fear of missing out. I'm seeing tweets, I wish I was there. I'm getting texts, I wish I could have gone. Um, good energy here. What is it like here for the folks who couldn't make it? What's going on here? You know, just amazing energy here. It's so fun to see all these incredibly smart, talented women all in one place, sharing their thoughts, sharing their excitement about our future. And that's what it feels like. This is all about the future. All right, Eileen Fagan, Vice President at Intuit here inside theCUBE, and we are looking to hire more people. If you want to be part of the CUBE team, we're looking for digital analysts, technical engineers, field producers, content managers, on-camera hosts. We are hiring women as well. We, we need women on our team. <laughs> um, we have an all-male crew here. We were kind of reprimanded, kind of you know, shamed <laughs> by the women in tech here, Jeff and I. Uh, we, we, we do want women on our team. Uh, we love women in tech. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back with more after this short break.